What's up guys and welcome daily theologians. That's you guys. So glad you're here. Today we are going to talk about the big one, the granddaddy of them all. Not really, but to a lot of people they get obsessed with the book of Revelations or uh, just Revelation. But it's uh, interesting. We've got some cool uh, information about Revelation today. And just to give you a heads up on my position, I hold my eschatology very loosely. I do believe there will be a thousand year literal reign on earth. I do believe that uh, at some point, the church will be caught up, uh, whether it's after the tribulation, before or during. Uh, uh, church history would say we go through some hard things, so probably don't expect to be uh, escaping anytime soon. However, I'm optimistic, and I would certainly love that, as would every Christian, I think. So don't have a hard and fast rule on that. Uh, but I do believe uh, in a literal kingdom, and uh, so... And it, it is yet to come. I, I would say it's still in the future. Uh, so for what that's worth, Hosea 13, we're in today. Psalm 140, Proverbs 29, and Revelation 1, 1 through 20. Revelations, as some would say. Hosea 13, Israel is still worshiping idols. And this is the pattern of humanity, always worshiping idols. Lord your God ever since the land of Egypt. So God is reminding them that he rescued them to demonstrate his power over Egypt. You shall know no God before me. There is no savior besides me. God is a covenant saving God. And this has always been the case from all eternity. He says, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. And I thought this was really cool. He says, I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be your plagues. He's kind of trash talking death. O grave, I will be your destruction. Pity is hidden from my eyes. So when God is uh, trash talking death, that's good. And it's very interesting because the Bible has always spoke of God's rescuing his people from sin, death, hell, and the grave. And of course, it's even here in Hosea. Don't you know? So uh, very good stuff there. And a reminder that the God of the Bible is triune and has never changed. This has always been his promise. God is promising to rescue them. MacArthur's note speaks of a time of personal resurrection as in Daniel chapter 12, which is a very good book. Uh, repentant Israelites will be restored to the land and even raised from death to glory. And then Paul uses this text in 1 Corinthians 15, 55 to celebrate the future resurrection of the church. The Messiah's great victory over death and the grave is the first fruits of the full harvest to come. Jesus said that. When all believers will likewise experience the power of his resurrection. So Paul, Jesus, and Hosea and Daniel all agree. And even the Exodus agrees, and I think I've mentioned this before, but the burning bush Jesus used to prove that people were raised from the dead when the Sadducees were disputing with him. He said, have you not read that I am the God of Jacob, of Abraham, etc.? God is the God of the living, not the God of the dead. So this theme of resurrection and eternal life keeps coming up where? Not in the New Testament, in the Old Testament, and then it's explained again in the New Testament. So we see that here. So uh, Jesus is going to crush death by death. So Hosea... Uh, goes on to say that Ephraim will turn from idols and uh, be fruitful again, and they will repent. In Psalm 140, we see that people are sharpening their tongues like a serpent. The poison of asps is under their lips. We see this, this type of language in Romans about the human heart being depraved. It's other places in the Bible as well. Proverbs 29, 23, a man's pride will bring him low, which is true because God hates pride. Now, on to the big granddaddy. Revelation 1, 1 through 20, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So when your chapter starts with the doxology, you know you're on to a, uh, to a good start. And that's not exactly the beginning, but essentially Revelation is an unveiling or a revealing. MacArthur's notes, we're going to have a lot of these for this section. Uh, the one who was, who is, and is to come, God's eternal presence is not limited by time. He's always been present and will come in the future. The seven spirits, two possible meanings. A reference to Isaiah's prophecy concerning the sevenfold ministry of the Holy Spirit. So people say the Holy Spirit is perfect in power, etc. So the seven, number of seven is a number of completeness. Uh, and then MacArthur says, more likely, it's a reference to the lampstand with seven lamps and menorahs. Zechariah is also a description of the Holy Spirit. Uh, used for this. In either case, the number seven is of completeness. John is identifying the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Oh, okay, there you go. So that's what he said. Uh, one like the Son of Man. This was Jesus' favorite title for himself, and he's referencing Daniel 7. This is actually why he was crucified. When people say Jesus never claimed to be God, total lie, uh, he said, you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds with glory, referencing Daniel 7. He's given the title deed to the universe, and the Jews say, blasphemy, and that is why they kill him. So recognize this title, very important. 
Uh, so we see one like the Son of Man clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace. And his voice is the sound of many waters. He saw him. I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and last. We also saw this during the transfiguration. We see this time and time again when people are in the presence of God. Isaiah, same way. Uh, I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. I'm a dead man. I'm undone. Woe is me, oy vey, etc. He who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. I have the keys of Hades and death. So even in the book of Revelation, John is writing about hell, of course, because this is a big theme of the gospel. This is the redemptive plan. Life, eternal life with God, and then death, which is called hell, which is not death. It's eternal punishment under God's judgment. So we see it again here. So again, your gospel should include the mention of God's wrath and hell that Jesus took on the cross, died, and rose. MacArthur's note 117, I fell at his feet, a common response to seeing the awesome glory of the Lord. And he references Genesis 17.3, 17, Numbers 16.22, Ezekiel 128, Isaiah 6, 1 through 8, Acts 9, 4, which that was the Apostle Paul that got knocked to the dirt on that one. The first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, Christ applies the Old Testament name for Yahweh, the covenant name for God from Genesis 20, I assume that's Genesis 22, 13, Isaiah 41, 4, 44, 6, 48, 12. This is why you want to read the Old Testament. Jesus is all over it. Now, in the Old Testament, we call him the Son of God or the second person of the Trinity because he has not yet added a human nature to his divine nature as we reference and, and say that. But just know it's Jesus in the Old Testament all over, in my opinion. MacArthur's note. Well, and you know, we know this because the book of Jude tells us who led them out of Egypt. It was Jesus. We know that uh, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. We know that Paul writes in Corinthians that Christ was the rock that displayed the water. Jesus said, I am the man of the bread that comes down from heaven, etc. And uh, Abraham rejoiced to see my day and was glad. Moses wrote of me, etc. So MacArthur's note, uh, Patmos envisions authorities had banished him there because of his faithful preaching of the gospel. Interesting note about this uh, idea of... Um, Patmos, um, it was basically a prison island, and he'd received a series of visions laid out in the future history of the world. It's very similar to Daniel. Okay, The book of Revelation, the book of Daniel, have a lot in common. You don't understand them? Read both. And Daniel's only at like 12 chapters, if I remember correctly. Persecution was about to break out, uh, according to MacArthur, on the seven churches so dear to the apostles' heart. So to those churches, Revelation provided a message of hope. God is sovereign, in control of all events of human history. And though evil often seems pervasive and wicked men all-powerful, their ultimate doom is certain. Which reminds me of that Martin Luther, who said uh, their doom, his doom is sure, because he sang that God is a mighty fortress. And so it's a helpful hymn, if you haven't uh, sung that one lately. Christ will come in glory to judge and rule. And then this is interesting. Revelation in Greek is apokalypsis, which means an uncovering or an unveiling. God is the God that reveals himself. And he reveals himself in three ways. Creation, number one. All people have general revelation of God. He has revealed himself to all people. It's axiomatic from creation. There is a creator. Number two, conscience. With knowledge, people have an inner light of morality. It actually refers to the brain. People often try to divorce emotion and brain. You can't divorce the two. And I've had people, um, as I teach the Bible, they, they say, well, I'm just trying to emotionally process this. Well, you can't divorce your brain from your emotion. Try it. You can't have an emotion without a brain. Anyways, uh, it's talking about the brain. And then uh, conscience, right from wrong, though. That's how we understand it. And then the last one, his special revelation, the Bible, God's Word. It is Theonoustos. It is God-breathed. It is inerrant in the original autographs. It is authoritative in all that it claims and teaches, and in the original manuscripts is without error. Now, what we have today is 100% accurate. You can trust it. There's just some commas and things like that that are out of place. It doesn't change any doctrine or meaning, and it has been preserved by God. It's a spiritual book. And the gospel is the power of God to us that are being saved, but to those who are perishing, it is foolishness. So hopefully the gospel is not foolishness to you, and you've repented and trusted in the death, burial, and resurrection of the God-man Jesus Christ, because as Revelation is telling us, the apostle John, whom Jesus loved, he is coming back soon, perhaps. Thanks for watching. Let, leave, leave a comment below. Let me know what you think. And remember to hammer that like button. Like the 95 Reeses, or theses. God bless.